Watkins had no previous history of abuse. He was a straight A student from a loving family and was on top of the music world. Instead of using his power for good, he turned into a monster and a predator who would target the most vulnerable and use them for his own sexual gratification. Ian Watkins was the frontman of the super successful band Lost Profits, who had seemingly done the impossible for a British band and broke into the US music scene. During this period, the world had no idea that the charismatic frontman was actually one of the worst child predators to ever exist, with his crime spree coming to an end in 2012 when he was charged with 13 child sex offences and the attempted rape of an 11 month old girl. This is the case of Ian Watkins. Ian Watkins was brought up in the Welsh Valley and actually had quite a comfortable upbringing. He was a straight A student in school, lived a teenage life without any controversy and was the stepson of a Baptist minister and a talented musician. Watkins had a passion for music from a very early age. In his teenage years, he met who would be a future Lost Prophets band member, Mike Lewis, who formed a thrash metal band called Aftermath. The band practiced out of Watkins shed in his back garden and was short lived, with Watkins being cited as being relentless with his goal of becoming a musician and not only that, but becoming a superstar. Watkins, desperate to reach his goal, formed another band with another future band member, Lee Gaze. And whilst this band had some success, this ultimately led to the creation of the now infamous Lost Profits in 1997. Lost Profits began touring in South Wales and saw success early on, which inevitably led to being noticed by record label Visible Noise following huge reviews from both Kerrang! and Metal Hammer magazines. Over the years, Lost Profits started gaining mainstream publicity, headlining their own shows and even supporting bands such as Linkin Park. The band's true breakout moment was the release of their 2004 studio album Start Something, which sold 2.5 million copies worldwide and even sold 890,000 in the US, which considering every aspiring band from the UK's goal was to break the US market was massive. The band seemed to be on top of the world for the following years, with Watkins leading the front line as a charismatic frontman who all the women seemed to love. Watkins portrayed himself as straight edge, meaning that he would never drink or do drugs when he had a performance as he wanted to give the best performance possible for his fans. The band toured some more, performed at huge festivals such as Glastonbury in the UK and even played gigs with Metallica and Slipknot. Lost Profits seemingly could do no wrong. The band were gaining momentum and truly taking the scene by storm. A quick glance at any of Lost Profits own tour performance shows what Lost Profits fans demographic consisted of, which was an army of teenage girls. Now this on its own would not be concerning. It is quite often the case of bands of a similar genre have a similar following, but pair this with what we know now and the rumours that were around at the time and this makes this case even more disturbing. One thing that was noted often but kept quiet along media outlets in fear of being refused an interview with the band was the amount of underage girls that were backstage at these concerts. Not just at the concerts but backstage with the band. And media outlets have often stated that it was often Watkins that looked all too familiar in these situations. Whilst the other band members stayed quiet the whole time during the Watkins timeline. After the charges, the band started releasing information about how they actually hated working with Watkins, and after their second studio album to start something, Watkins began using hard drugs consistently, such as cocaine and crystal meth. It even got to the point where the band claimed that Ian had his own private dressing room, which you could argue may be an attempt of the other band members to deny any knowledge of Watkins' disturbing behaviour. Every member of the band claims that the only illegal activity they ever witnessed from Watkins was his drug use, and that even they had claimed to hold many interventions and threatened to kick him out of the band as a result of this. Fast forward to 2010, in which the band had been touring alongside recording their third studio album, The Betrayed, and this is where it was obvious that cracks started to form in the band. In early 2010, numerous tours were cancelled and tickets refunded with no reason given to the fans. The reality was the band were realising that Watkins had a depressingly sad drug addiction, which in their words, snuck up on them. This led to Watkins not turning up to performances, or when he was there, he was clearly under the influence and performed poorly. The boiling point for this was in 2012 when Lost Profits played in the Cardiff Motorpoint Arena. According to the band, the performance was a disaster, with the band saying that Watkins didn't move for the whole set and that he was singing the wrong words. This led to the band staging another intervention for Watkins in which they discussed breaking up the band, but ultimately Watkins decided to check into rehab whilst the band took a break from touring for two months. That specific performance actually led to a physical altercation between Watkins and bass player Richardson, with Richardson reflecting in, in an interview on on the incident. So I come off the stage fucking livid, go on the bus, Ian's on the bus, and I'm like, nice one, and he gives me some shit, and 
I black the fuck out and I'm laying punches into his face. I'm not fucking proud of it, but I'm laying punches into his face for 10 seconds or 10 minutes. I don't know. And I'm a big boy compared to him, so I'm not proud of this. And then he gives me this fucking look after I hit him. And I had this can of monster energy in my hand and I smashed this fucking can into his head. And I'm like, fuck. I go outside and puke. And for the next three weeks, he's like black eyes, cut on his face. And I'm like feeling fucking horrible about the whole thing. And that's what I did. And that's what I did when he missed the show. You know what I mean? If I knew anything, if I had an inkling about any of that shit, his crimes. This would be the beginning of the end for Watkins, with 2012 being the year he was found out to be one of the most disgusting human beings to exist in the music scene. On December 3rd, 2012, Watkins tweeted out that he was en route to the Big Smoke to shoot our new music video, promoting the band without a care in the world. Fast forward 16 days later, and on 19th of December, 2012, Watkins was charged with 13 sexual offences against children, including the attempted rape of an 11 month old girl. This was not only a day that shook up the music scene forever, but a day that had ultimately ended Watkins' disgusting run of abuse and took away any freedom he had had. The worst bit about this, this could have easily have been prevented had the police listened to any of the one of six people that had expressed concerns of Watkins' sexual interest in children over a four year period. Watkins initially was not even arrested in 2012 due to the child sex offences. It was actually an unrelated drug charge to which police coincidentally began making the disturbing discovery of the nature of his crimes. The most publicised example of this was with Watkins' ex-girlfriend Joanne. Joanne was in a constant on and off relationship with Watkins from 2006 to 2008, which was relatively normal other than Watkins spiralling drug abuse. Joanne stated she never witnessed anything that indicated Watkins would be a sex offender, but did find it strange that there were so many young girls around the band that often. Joanne began receiving disturbing text messages from Watkins in 2008, following an incident in a video discovered by the police in which the two are having sex and Watkins Watkins is heard to tell Joanne that he can't wait to get you pregnant so they would have a child to abuse. Joanne then received a text message from Watkins in 2008 in which he bragged to Joanne that he had sex with multiple underage girls. Joanne, disgusted by this, went to the police immediately that same day. But unfortunately, this would be the first of many instances in which Joanne was ignored. Now, from looking at this case, I personally feel many factors went into why the police chose to ignore Joanne's pleas to review the evidence that she was more than willing to provide. The first being that Joanne was previously a sex worker and they may not have judged her to be a reliable source of information and labelled her as a jealous ex. Watkins at the time was on top of the world, especially in his hometown, so the police knew that any allegation of this nature would bring a lot of scrutiny and publicity to the force. Joanne had physically been down to the police station on that day with her phone and laptop as proof, asking for an officer to review the disturbing text messages, to which she was told that the female officer at the time was not trained to review the data on the laptop. Whilst that may be true, it is extremely negligent to not at least review the text and then deem it if it is a appropriate for the correct department to triage it. There is simply no excuse for that level of negligence. Following an investigation retrospectively from the IPCC, and that's basically the people who police the police, it was found there were numerous instances in which Watkins could have been apprehended had they simply just listened to the victims reporting at the time. Joanne repeatedly made reports to the police, but every time a report was made, it was soon closed due to insufficient evidence, despite not all lines of reasonable inquiries even being considered, never mind followed. Joanne made another report in December 2008, this time in which she reported Watkins bragging having sex with an underage girl and giving the child cocaine. No officer even visited the child or their parents, despite Joanne providing all of the details. All of Joanne's reports were considered false and Watkins was allowed to continue his disturbing behaviour and worst of all, openly bragging about it to Joanne, knowing he would get away with it. The police even wrote that Joanne was of poor character and that she'd been sectioned under the Mental Health Act, which Joanne had proven in court was simply untrue. Joanne was not the only source of information to the police regarding Watkins' behaviour. Over the next four years, numerous complaints and intelligence reports about Watkins' alleged drug use and sexual interest in children were submitted to South Wales Police and other forces. In March 2012, a woman told police Watkins may have sexually assaulted an 11-month-old boy. She gave police a description of images that could be found on his computer and his password, but officers took no steps to investigate. The following month, an Australian woman told police that Watkins was a child abuser and drug abuser. Her email concluded, please do not disregard this as it is serious. Again, nothing happened. Police finally took action in June 2012 when they received information that Watkins, now 40, regularly imported drugs from the US. They raided his home and found disturbing and overwhelming evidence that he was a paedophile. Despite Joanne not being taken seriously by the police, following numerous reports, she decided to take matters into her own hands and play along with Watkins' sick and twisted mindset in the hopes of gathering enough evidence against him that the police would finally listen to her pleas. In a plot twist, following the arrest of Watkins, Joanne herself was actually charged for possession 
of the indecent images she had received from Watkins. But ultimately, the courts had an ounce of common sense and deemed her not guilty. This then led to the truly disturbing discovery of the extent of Watkins' predatory behaviour. Upon investigation, it was found that Watkins had been grooming his young fans in order to sexually assault their children, even before the initial report in 2008, and that he'd been using drugs with the parents as a way to facilitate this. The true extent of these crimes are beyond disturbing. The level of these acts will not be coming out of my mouth. If you wish to view the court document in full, this is available online with a quick Google search, but I will warn you, this is disturbing reading. The extent of Watkins' predatory behaviour truly is shocking, but even more so was this complete disregard for his actions. Upon his arrest, the password for his laptop was I fuck kids. Just let that sink in for a moment. The first highlighted case of Watkins committed such an offence was when he engaged in sexual conversations with an underage fan, asking if he could take her virginity while she wore a school uniform. Watkins provided cocaine for the underage girl and recorded the act without her knowing, having sexual intercourse, anal intercourse, and then proceeding to urinate on her, degrading her the whole time. This is a recurring theme in Watkins' behaviour, in which he would use drugs on underage girls and then record the acts without their knowledge for his own gratification. One of the most disturbing series of events within the court documents is when Watkins is found to have groomed two separate young fans that had infant children. He had grown a relationship with both of these mothers, engaged in frequent drug use, and then began showing his predatory behaviour. Watkins knew the women would do anything to have a relationship with him, even sacrifice their own children, which is exactly what they did. Again, I do not physically want to say these acts out loud as they are truly disturbing, but it was found that both the parents and Watkins himself had all engaged in sexual activity with the infants. The mothers were digitally and orally penetrating their own children whilst Watkins was watching and masturbating, then taking his turn to sexually abuse the child. Some of the text exchanges were truly disturbing between the mothers and Watkins in which they frequently planned the abuse of the children, boasted about it after, and often committed these offences over video calls. One text exchange discussed how Watkins planned on prostituting the 11-month-old child to fat, rich, old men, and that this is the only life that she would know. To further add to the distress, it was found that Watkins and the mothers were even providing their infant children doses of drugs. Most of the abuse was recorded again for Watkins' satisfaction. It is found that Watkins had attempted to penetrate the 11-month-old girl, but it is not known if he did so. Therefore, he was ultimately charged with the attempt, not the act. Watkins was ultimately charged with 13 child sex offences, along with the attempted rape of an 11-month-old baby. The names of the mothers involved have always remained anonymous due to the protection of their children, but it should be noted that they are just as much at fault as Watkins, if not more so due to abusing the position of being a parent. They are both currently serving lengthy prison sentences, and rightly so. Watkins truly thought he was untouchable, openly committing these acts and bragging about them, and unfortunately, the complete failure of the police led to the continuation of his predatory behaviour. In reflection, if someone had taken time to just listen to Joanne, Watkins would have been behind bars much sooner and this could have all been prevented. Watkins is a dangerous individual and poses a serious threat to the public. He was sentenced to 29 years with 6 years probation, but whilst in prison during a strip search in March 2018, Watkins was found to be in possession of a mobile phone. This was only found when Watkins handed over the phone in fear that he would not be able to see his mum who was due to visit. On the mobile phone, it was found that Watkins was texting a previous ex-girlfriend from his prison cell, to which he denied and claimed that he was being threatened to hide the phone by some seriously dangerous people. The court called bullshit on this, denied his claim, and he was charged an additional 10 months, which was added to his sentence. This is truly one of the saddest and most disturbing cases I've ever come across, and to see that this simply could have been prevented had someone just listened makes this case even worse. Never remain silent, always take action. And if the people who need to hear it aren't listening, then kick down every single door along the way until someone does.